host today. With me, I have Mansi, uh, who's a strategy expert at, at Ichimata, and she's going to be your co-host. Now, the topic of this webinar and our goal in this session is to help each one of you create a personalized study plan to, to help you achieve um, you know, your target GMAT score. And, and not just achieve that score, but guide you through what I would call as most probably the, the, the most optimal path to that score. Uh, and, 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 and during this journey, we're going to really talk about many things, such as what does the GMAT actually test? Um, how do you go about creating a study plan? We'll talk about uh, the concept of ability and we'll compare that to accuracy. And then we'll also talk about the various stages of learning that an individual goes through to achieve excellence on, on the GMAT. But, but before we do that, let's kind of talk a bit more about you guys. Let's learn a bit more about this cohort that we have over here. We've got 50 students here. And... Um, and, and, and so um, uh, I want to know a bit more about you now. Um, but before we do that, um, I know many of you are preparing for the GMAT. And if you need help in um, topics other than building a study plan, we have some upcoming webinars. We have a free number properties webinar, um, which we have tomorrow. And this we will talk about uh, the concept of divisibility and remainder. We'll start with the, with, the, with the very fundamentals. And then we'll build on those fundamentals using the remainder equation. And, and help you solve the most challenging 700 level questions. In fact, in this webinar, it's a very fun webinar. We start with actually three um, very challenging data sufficiency 700 level questions. And we really just say, okay, this is what our goal is to, 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 to essentially make sure that you guys are able to solve these questions. And usually when we start with those questions in the first, um, in the first attempt, about 30% of people are able to get those correct. But then, um, after the webinar, we attempt those questions again, and, and accuracy then goes from the 30 to about 60, 65%. And, and considering that these are really difficult questions, that's an incredible improvement in accuracy um, during the webinar. So, so that's 24, uh, exactly 24 hours from now. That's a day from now. So if you've not registered for that, definitely do that. And then next week, um, uh, we have a webinar on, on pre-thinking and critical reasoning in which we focus on uh, assumption-based questions there. Uh, we, we, again, talk about the fundamentals of assumptions, and then we build on those fundamentals, add pre-thinking and visualization to those, and, and solve about three of the most challenging CR questions um, uh, uh, using pre-thinking. And then we, we demonstrate that how when you use pre-thinking, when you build on that visualization ability, those challenging questions, the logic of those questions appears to be extremely simple, and you're able to reject incorrect answer choices with a lot of confidence. Again, that's exactly a week from now. Right. Um, with that, let's kind of get to know you guys a bit better. So uh, I want to know when do you plan to take the GMAT? Um, then the next question that I want to ask you is, um, is, is essentially, what's your target GMAT score? If you haven't responded to, to either one of these questions, you can do that now. Uh, Okay, so when do people plan to take the GMAT? About half of the folks haven't taken a date as of yet. You can see about 40 of you haven't taken a date as of yet. Uh, then the next big group is those who plan to take the test in, the, in 46 to 75 days. And and and, and so that's um, uh, uh, around about 90% of the folks or 88% of the folks. And then we have another, we have another 12% who are in the, the 0 to, to 45 days. And with regards to the target GMAT score, about half the class is aiming for a score of 760 or higher. Now, um, I want to ask this other question. It's a simple yes, no question. Um, and, 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 and the question is, how many of you have heard of the GMAT focus um, edition? How many of you have heard of that? Select yes if you have and select no otherwise. Um, for those of you who have not heard of you know, the focus edition, uh, it's you know the new format that the GMAT's uh, uh, proposing in the uh, uh, in, in in second half of this year, and um, and and essentially this is so so there will be a time where you'll have the current version of the GMAT which will run through the end of the year and and potentially in the first quarter of next year, and then there's a new version of the GMAT um, that that that's upcoming and and that's something that we expect. We don't have a firm date as of yet uh, from the GMAC, but we expect it to to start sometime in um, uh, from August onwards. And and um, so if you've not heard of it, um, you know definitely uh, 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 get to know a bit more about it. Let me actually, I I wrote an article on that, uh, so let me share a blog post on that. And the article says GMAT Focus Edition. What do we know so far? Let me.
there's also um, an excellent video that that outlines the changes now if you're an eg math student um you know you a you should be aware of this change uh, but b you don't need to worry because um uh, as soon as soon as this was announced we promise that that as soon as we get more details we'll make sure that your your current eg math course is um is, is compatible with the focus edition as well as with the current format of the GMAT so that you have an option of whichever format you choose. Uh, you, you'll have the best support there as you'll have the most successful course um, uh, uh, supporting you to help uh, achieve your target GMAT score. So that's something that that be available free of charge to you guys and, and you'll have the ability to, to choose whichever edition you choose and in your study plans and all of those other things will be adapted accordingly. We've already started working on it and uh, and, and we're working with the GMAC to make sure that we, we we know the nuts and bolts of this new edition and, and so that we can help you um, excel on that. Okay. Now, I want to ask this other question. <laughs> and this is primarily for those who, um, who know about the focus edition. And my question is, which exam do you prefer? If you know about the focus edition, you know, what's your preference? If you don't know, then don't bother answering this question. But if you know about it, um, you know, do you prefer the current GMAT or do you prefer the focus edition? If you know about it, that is, and you can already see there's a there's a 30-70 you know, split. And and uh, um, and let me ask this, uh, I'm gonna put in the chat part over here. Um, let's bring in a new chat because this is from my previous session. We clear all chat. So why do you prefer the focus edition or why do you prefer the current GMAT? You can really say focus edition and here is my reason and current GMAT, here is my reason. So why do you prefer one or the other? Let's kind of get that as well. Meanwhile, I can hide some of these polls so we have a bit more real estate uh, uh, with us. All right, focus edition eliminates SC, geometry, and AWA, shorter, no WA. Oh, there's CR. Uh, Herschel, there is CR. CR actually uh, gets a lot more focus in the uh, in, in the focus edition, um, but shorter uh, duration. And those of you who uh, prefer the current version, they, they say familiarity with, with, the, with the current fashion. Um, Webu says, Sentence correction is a good skill to learn. I like the attitude, Vibhu, um, uh, overall. Um, so that's good. OK. Dipanshu says, current edition tests overall capability helps in all areas. Again, you can really see, depending on who you are, different people have different preferences. And, and there's no right or wrong over here. Um, it's just it's important to know what you prefer and what you're aiming for and, and prepare accordingly. Current one because I like geometry. Again, if you if you like geometry, uh, you're strong in it. Then definitely, you know that does the current one does give you a, a leg up overall. Okay, let's get a, a, a couple of more inputs and then we will move on to uh, uh, the core part of the session overall. What is GMAT Focus Edition and which one do we have to give if you plan to take the test next month? Next month, you only can you can only take the current GMAT. If you want to know what the Focus Edition is, you have this link on the left-hand side which says GMAT Focus Edition um, uh, in, in this web link spot. You can look at that. Uh, both editions, uh, B schools would be be ambivalent to both editions. So, so, so um, the current one as well as the focus edition. So, so it's not that one would hold a higher weight uh, than the others. Other that's something that we we hope. Uh, I know definitely the the current version of the GMAT B schools understand it. They they know the kind of results that it delivers. So, so definitely they're a bit more familiar with the current version than um, they have a history with the current version than the focus edition. But I'm sure the GMAC would do. A, a really good job of convincing B schools um, uh, with regards to the validity of the focus edition. Hmm. And yes, your all, all of those things are there in the FAQs and in in, in the article uh, overall. Okay, with regards to the grading, let's not let's not get there, but but very very similar with regards. So whatever sections um, you know the GM AC has retained in the focus edition, they're graded the same way. Yes. 
So, Saurabh, if you are preparing, uh, 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 if you've started preparing, if you plan to take the test in August, uh, stick with the current version. And and the, because the current version will be valid till uh, at least till January of 2024. So, so you'd be able to take the current version at least. My guess is it will be valid at least till April of 2024, if not till July of 2024. Okay. All right, guys, with that, if you have any more questions about the focus edition, I'd be happy to take those questions towards the end. Let's get into the core of this webinar. Does that make sense? Can we all agree to keep the focus edition aside um, for the next two hours? And then let's get it get started with the core of this webinar. And if you have questions, I'd, I'd put aside uh, 15 minutes and, and address those questions. Okay. All right, that's wonderful. Okay, with that, we are now in the webinar pane, and um, you know, uh, either the screen will have changed for you by now, or the screen should be in the process of changing for you. And when you see the presentation which says, "How do you score 95th percentile or better on the GMAT?" That's when you know the screen has settled down for you. The system has settled down for you. So I'm going to again put in a yes/no poll, uh, uh, and if you can see the presentation, select yes. If you can't see the presentation, then you may select no. And if you can't see the presentation, then then just join again, and the problem should sort out by itself. So it seems most of you can see the presentation. OK, so just some housekeeping rules over here. So what you see in the center is the presentation. I talked to a presentation, and 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 and, and you know hopefully everything goes smoothly, and 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 you guys will learn how to ways to GMAT, and and we'll go ways to GMAT, and come thank me uh, later on. Um, but if you have questions during the session. We have this thing called a Q&A pod right below the presentation. You can ask those questions in the Q&A pod, and, and Mansi or I would respond to those questions, depending on whether I think that question is, is something that others may have as well, or whether it's something that's very specific to you. But either way, you'll get that question answered. Um, if that question is something that I want to address post the webinar, for example, of the questions about how do you get a scholarship in a particular school, or, or, or a very specific case, then I would reserve that question for the end of the webinar. Now, this right-hand space, this space over here, is the space where I ask my question. Now, we have about 90 students in the webinar. And, and to make sure that we do justice to each one of you, to make sure that we keep this session interactive, I ask a lot of poll questions. And, and this is where I put in my poll question. So throughout the webinar, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll ask about 60-odd um, about poll questions. So that's about one question every two minutes or so from this point on. and. Um, and, and, and so the, the way you get the most out of this webinar is if you, if you stay active, you respond to those poll questions. Okay, so just uh, uh, in terms of housekeeping rules, right-hand column is the space for my questions, your answers, below the presentation, your questions, and which is where Mansi or I would respond to those. Okay, all right. Um, now, we have a very simplistic agenda in this webinar. So we're going to talk about, um, again, our goal is to make sure that each one of you has a clear idea of how to get to your target GMAT score. And, 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 and you know, at each GMAT, whatever we do, we start with a very solid foundation. Um, and, and so the first thing that we're going to really do is we're going to talk about fundamentals of the GMAT. That's, that's where we're going to spend about 20, 25 minutes or so. Then we'll build on those fundamentals and help you build your study plan. And then once you have an idea of how do you build a personalized study plan, what are the steps that you follow, and how does a personalized study plan allow you to focus your time, your energy on the areas where you need the most help, then we will talk about um, how do you execute on that study plan, what metrics should you track, and, and how sh should you do course correction if and when needed, and which is where part three of the st strategy for predictable success. Again, our... Uh, uh, my goal here today is to give you a path uh, which is 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 for you the most predictable and the shortest path and uh, to your target GMAT score, number one. Number two is to make sure that you know when you're executing um, uh, on that path in, in, in the right manner and you know when, you, when you're faltering on that path. Both are important. Why? Because um, in no one who studies for the GMAT executes on, on on this flawlessly. And, and when you have the knowledge of, hey, this is where I'm faltering, you can reach out for, for help. And, and that's why we are here. We can help you um, overcome that score plateau. We can help you overcome the your struggles and, and move you to that next level. Okay. With that, let's kind of start with the fundamentals of the GMAT. And, and one of the, so throughout this session, 
I'm going to ask you to write down very few things because I will give you the session PDF. But there are a few things that I want to make sure that you write down. Why? Because the process of writing things down cements those things in our brain. And I want you to, to uh, those things to, to be with you during the webinar as well as after the webinar. Now, the first thing that I want you to kind of write down is when it comes to async the GMAT, your primary focus should be on building ability. And the reason I want to talk about this is because when people think about getting to a 730, 740, 760, 780, um, they, 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 they kind of split their focus among multiple things. Yes, they want to learn things, which is where building ability comes in, but, but they also start to focus very early on timing. They start to focus on exam strategy. They kind of focus on practicing right away and, and, and really just saying, hey, if I'm going to take mocks, I want to figure out which question I want to attempt, when to, to leave a question, and so on and so forth. Now, these things, they are important. Okay, uh, but but these are, um, are 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 important towards the last part of your preparation, towards the last twenty days, not in the beginning of your of your preparation overall. Let me put in another short answer part over here. Okay, all right. So again, acing the GMAT ninety percent of of whether you get to your target GMAT score depends on on whether you have built this ability or not. Now, I'm going to ask this question. I have about 90 students here right now. How many of you, right when you start preparing for the GMAT, start focusing on these things? Timing, exam strategy, taking mocks, and so on and so forth. And again, be honest over here. How many of you? And you can type in the, the short answer part over here. Okay. Again, important things, not in the beginning of the pres uh, of 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 uh, of, of um, of your preparation, but towards the fag end of it. And essentially, if you do things right, what you'd find is most of these things will fall in place automatically. Okay. If you don't do it, that's wonderful. If you do do it, just tell yourself to stop yourself from doing it unless and until you are within 20 to 30 points of your target GMAT score. Okay. <coughs> okay. And it's right. And the reason why I want to make you write these things down is because even when you understand it, unless and until you write these things down, type it out, you know, it doesn't um, uh, it uh, it doesn't c uh, cement in your in, in your brain. I want to make sure that that it stays in your brain when you study the next time. You you resist that urge to go and blindly solve questions and solve questions in under two minutes when you're just starting off. Okay, now I want to talk about a couple of other things. So um, so there is this term called accuracy, and I want to make sure that I define what ability is. Now, all of us know what accuracy is. When you take a 10-question quiz, you get eight out of those 10 questions correct. You say my accuracy is 80%. Um, now, an accuracy is what I call as an absolute measure. You know, In that 10-question quiz, you may have answered eight out of those 10 questions correctly. And if 100 people take those quiz, um, more than half of them could have answered eight or more of those questions correctly. So even though you have an accuracy of 80%, your percentile in that quiz may be just about 50th percentile. Your ability, on the other hand, is a comparative measure. It tells you how good you performed compared to others. Um, I'll take another case in point. You may take another 10 question quiz, and if those quests is composed of hard questions and your accuracy, and this is 70%, your ability, that 70% accuracy may translate to 95% ability. Again, depends on, on the testing items or the kind of questions that you practice. So again, ability is a comparative measure. Accuracy is is absolute measure. Really, really important. For some reason, my pen is not working as well as I would want it to be. Again, on the GMAT, ability is what's important. Why? Because the GMAT is overall a rank. Okay. Now, let's just prove this to you to really say why is it that accuracy is not as precise a measure on the GMAT. To do this, I'm going to compare GMAT attempts for two different students, um, student one and student two, or case one and case two. And on, 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 on x-axis, we have question numbers. And on y-axis, we have the difficulty level of questions. So which means the higher we go on y-axis, the more difficult a question becomes. The lower we are on y-axis, the easier a question is. Okay. Um, and, 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 and the GMAT follows a similar algorithm, not the exact same algorithm, but a very similar algorithm. If you understand this algorithm, you'd be able to understand how the GMAT works really well. Okay. So student one or case one gets the first question. Uh, the first question usually is around that median difficulty level, and you'll, you'll see why that is the case. The, you get the first question right. 
Then he gets the second question. It's a more challenging question. You can see we are going higher on the y-axis over here. So he gets the second question right as well. And, and correspondingly, the third question is even more challenging. He gets that question wrong. As you can see, there's a crossover here. Accordingly, the fourth question, the difficulty level of that fourth question is between that of question number two and question number three. How do we judge that? You can, if you draw horizontal lines between two and three, you can see four is right smack in between these two. He gets that right. Gets the fifth question slightly more challenging. Gets that wrong as well. Okay. Let me actually remove this. Okay. So that's student one. Student one or uh, student two or case two. Gets the first question, median difficulty level, gets that question wrong. Okay, you can really see the X over here. Accordingly, gets an easier question, which is why we're going lower on the Y axis. Uh, gets that question correct. Gets the third question slightly more challenging. The difficulty levels between that of question number one and question number two. Gets that wrong. Gets an easier question. Gets that right. And gets the next question which is slightly more challenging and right as well so we're only going to focus on the first five questions and we, we and, and let's kind of assume that we end their test over here so the test is only composed of five questions so my simple question to you is at the end of five um, uh, questions if we end the test who do you think will get a higher score who's doing better is it student one or student two all right let's get a few more responses Again, I have about 37, 40. I have 90 students. Let's get to 60 responses. Who do you think would get a higher score if I end the test at question number five or right after question number five? I have 50 responses. Let's get 10 more responses. And this is really important. Why? Because when you when you put a stake in the ground, when you when you mark an answer, you put a stake in the ground, you really take a position. And, and either you're right, it, it confirms your beliefs, or you're wrong, and then you correct your beliefs. So for 55, five more students, who's doing better? Who do you think will get a higher score if we end the test? Let's see, can we get five more responses, four more? I have 56. And again, this is what I call as a really low risk environment. You know, you, you get it wrong, no one's judging you. Uh, uh, the only thing by participating that you get is benefit. 59, one more person. One more person. Ah, 60 responses. That's wonderful. Let me end the poll. Let me broadcast the results. And you can see 82% of you say student one's doing better. 18% um, of you say student two is doing better. Now, when you look at the accuracy, both of these students have, um, um, uh, 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 have answered three out of five questions correctly. 60% accuracy. So why do you think student one's doing better? What's the reason why that the, that student one, the test would award student one a higher score? What do you think is the reason? Difficulty level, what do you mean? Difficulty level of correct questions. Can you elaborate a bit more? Student one has answered, has demonstrated better ability or in other words, has, has answered more challenging questions correctly. Okay. So if you think about it, student one has got five questions. Each one of them were either at the average difficulty level or above the average difficulty level. Student two, on the other hand, got only the first question, which was at the average difficulty level. Every other question was below the average difficulty level. In other words, the test did not even give student two the opportunity to answer questions, uh, to answer challenging questions. They didn't even serve those questions to you. Why? Because, because uh, the student two did not demonstrate uh, that, that ability. And because student one uh, uh, answered more challenging questions correctly, even though both the both uh, student one and student two have identical accuracy. Student one would get a higher score. Okay, so when it comes to asking the GMAT, you have two challenges that you need to overcome. First one is to make sure that the test serves difficult questions to you. Um, there's something called a question picker on the test. It decides which question is appropriate for you, and you have to make sure that the question picker thinks that it it needs to serve that needs to serve the most challenging or, or, or uh, 700 level questions to you. And the second is to make sure that uh, that that you uh, you answer those questions. You get 700 level questions served to you. You need to answer those difficult questions correctly with a reasonable accuracy. And a reasonable accuracy is around at 65% level or so. Okay. 
Now, how many of you think in the algorithm, the GMAT algorithm is really complex, man, this is really challenging. How many of you have heard this to really say, hey, the algorithm is really complex. Don't bother trying to understand uh, how the algorithm works and, and, and you won't be able to understand it. How many of you have heard that? Yes, no, yes, yes. Okay, many of you have heard. So the GMAT, the algorithm overall, is, um, is essentially a very logical algorithm. It's not a fairly challenging algorithm. Um, any of you, any one of you uh, design algorithms for a living over here? Yes, okay. Uh, the, the GMAT algorithm is actually, um, if, you, if you look at the algorithm implementations of, of the early 2000, um, it's 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 actually an estimation algorithm which uses it, which is not world class by today's standards, but but it was something that was world class in the early two thousands, which is kind of when we moved towards the adaptive nature of the test. And and really, it's not a difficult algorithm to understand if you um, if you've hired anyone. The, the GMAT works the same way um, that 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 you would that a human being would if you were to hire someone. How many of you have hired an individual? To, to work for you. Okay, I see a few more yeses. And again, if you've not hired someone, but if you've gone through a hiring process, you kind of know a bit about it as well. I'm, I'm hoping most of you have gone through the hiring process where um, you've been placed. Now, let's kind of look, assume that you are an interviewer and your job is to place a candidate in one of these five positions. So if you work for a company, you're an interviewer, there are five positions that exist, starting from the junior most, which is an analyst, to executive vice president. Uh, <coughs> that, that's, uh, that's the highest position. Now, and for simplicity, we have five positions as well. Now, tell me this. If you take this candidate... And 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 you answer you you serve that person questions which are director level questions, and the person is unable to answer those questions. You serve the the person three questions, and the person is only able to answer one out of those three questions correctly. What would you do? What's your natural inclination? You maybe the person is an analyst, maybe the person is a manager. We don't know, but definitely not a director. Okay. And that's kind of how the GMAT does as well. It says, okay, uh, uh, let's, if a person on, answers a certain difficulty level questions, is unable to answer, you know, let's say medium level uh, questions with, with, with high accuracy, let's, then, then the GMAT reduces that difficulty level and says, let's just place this, this person uh, at a manager level. If the person is unable to do that, then, then it, it moves down. And then the person is unable to do that, it moves down, down, and down, and down, and down. Okay. Now, this is in a simplistic term, but five levels. How many levels do you think the, the GMAT has with regards to placing you in, in one of the score buckets? How many levels do you think the GMAT has? What are the score ranges? What, what's the lowest GMAT score that you could get? What's the highest GMAT score you could get? The lowest is 200, and the highest you can get is, and the highest you can get is 800. What are the intervals between these? 10. So how many levels does this make? 61. It's A minus B plus 1. Does that make sense? 61, 800 minus 200, and you divide it by 10 plus 1. Okay, so, so essentially the GMAT does this. It asks you questions, uh, both in quant and verbal, and places you in one of those 61 levels. That's what it is. Okay, all right. But again, what the GMAT's constantly trying to do is it gauge your ability, and, and by, by gauging your ability, it, it puts you in a certain level. Okay. Um, and again, so your performance on the GMAT is your reflection of your is the reflection of your ability on the test. Now, a lot of people, when it comes to 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 acing the test, they they really just say, "Hey, a lot depends on 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 essentially how I do on the test day." In my experience, 
uh, of having worked with upwards of 50,000 students, you ace the GMAT or you fail on the GMAT during your prep phase. Your actual performance on the test day, test day for a majority of individuals is a reflection of their preparation. The only exception to this is people who do special things on their test day where, where they really say, hey, I'm going to... I've been taking mocks in, with a certain strategy, but on the GMAT, I want to maximize my performance and I'm going to change that strategy. Has anyone done that? You know, taken mocks one way and, and taking the GMAT the other way? There are usually a few people who've done that and who've gotten a shock on the, on, on, on their actual uh, GMAT exam. Usually people who are retakers do this. Yep. But primarily, if you if you take the GMAT just as a mock, you know, whatever you've been scoring on mocks, you'd get between 20 to 30 points um, of, of, of that. If you change the strategy on that very test day, really bad idea, that's when you, you see a drop of 100 points or, or 80 points or more. Okay. Now, this was just, you know, uh, we were talking about how things work in principle. Let's kind of uh, share some more... Um, concrete data so what i have and, and we, we talked about that gmat's not a test of your accuracy but a test of your ability what we have over here is verbal attempts on um, on a gmat prep now gmat prep used to be the official gmat exam in 2018 or before and there was a beautiful piece of software uh, which you could use for simulations to understand the, the the gmat algorithm and i told you a lot about how the gmat worked um and, and, and essentially what you see over here is GMAT prep attempts of two different students, um, 41 questions. So the verbal section was 41 questions then. And, and the, the red squares are the, the question numbers where students made mistakes. Now, if you were to compare these two students between question numbers 11 and 41, what you're going to find is there's very little to, to differentiate these two students. Both of them have made nine mistakes between 11 and 41. Those mistakes are more or less evenly spaced as well. Now you'd expect, the only exception is this guy made uh, these mistakes overall. Now, if you had just your accuracy lens, you would expect these guys to kind of have very similar scores. But when you look at reality, it's, it's really different. Um, student one got a V43, which is 97th percentile, or which was 97th percentile then, it is 96th percentile now, actually. There is no V43 now, that's only a V44 or a V42. V43 used to exist then. This guy, got a V32, which was a 65th percentile or a 70,000 rank. Now, a lot of people look at this and, and they're very worried about this. So they say, hey, the GMAT's harsh. How many of you, when you think about this, really just say, hey, the GMAT seems to be a really harsh test. I'm going to put in my yes, no poll here. If you think the GMAT's harsh based on this data, select yes, otherwise select no. Is the GMAT harsh when you look at this data? Again, this data, I'm going to share this. You can see the data again. Let's get about 50 responses, at least 50. I have about 38 responses, 40, 41. Is the GMAT harsh? Let's get 50 responses. 45. 46. 47, 48, is the GMAT harsh, 49, one more, cool, 51, let me end the poll, you can see how half of you believe, it's just such a beautiful symmetry, half of you believe the GMAT's harsh, the other half, or 25, 27 versus 27 believe the GMAT's not harsh. Okay. The GMAT's actually a, a fairly forgiving exam. It's one of the best design tests out there. Um, and you think about it, you know, this guy was able to get to 97 percentile despite making nine mistakes and nine out of 41 for almost 22 percent, getting 22 percent of the questions wrong. So clearly, it's not a harsh test. There are very few other exams where you can make these many mistakes and, and get such a high score. So then when people really say this and they say, okay, you know, if, if, if that's the case, then, then and, and if I can't judge um, uh, my performance using accuracy, then what is the measure of my performance? How does the GMAT place me at, at a 60th percentile versus a 97th percentile or so? 
and 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 the answer's ability okay so 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 that's something that that's there so so when you look at these two students and their accuracy seem very similar but when you look at them through the lens of ability these were their ability scores so the v43 student the 95th percentile ability in sc a 95th percentile ability in cr and an 87th percentile ability in R rc whereas a v32 student had this measure of ability now when you look at these two students through the lens of ability do they look very different Yes. Again, go back to that hiring example where I said, you know, you, you you have an hour to judge whether to place someone as an analyst or whether to place someone as an EVP. So within that hour, you'd be able to answer, uh, ask only a certain number of questions. Now, and, and, and you know, everyone is going to get a certain number of questions wrong. Now, whether you're placed as an EVP or as an analyst depends on the kind of question that, that the test asks you or the interviewer asks you. This is the same thing over here. You can't just look at accuracy and place someone as an analyst versus an EVP, right? It depends on which questions were asked. It depends on, 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 that, on the difficulty level. And then, of course, to a certain degree, accuracy. Now, when I place this and really just look at this ability, look at the ability chart or when you, you draw the parallel to, um, to, to an analyst versus an EVP, I think the system becomes a lot more uh, logical or, or a lot more digestible. It seems a lot more simpler. Right? So always remember the hiring example when you want to make any decisions. So how is the ability score calculated? That's a, a great question. Um, again, uh, um, XYZ, if you are an algorithm designer or if you're really good with probability, um, I'd be happy to tell you. But but essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to create... A, 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 so in, in, in SC, for example, when the test serves a certain difficulty level of questions to you, um, and you answer a certain, let's say your your hard accuracy is seventy percent, the test says, "What is the likelihood of someone getting seventy percent of hard questions correct?" Uh, when I compare uh, you to to all the other test takers, and and that likelihood usually puts you in the top three to top four percent of test takers, and that's where you get ninety seven percent ability. Okay, so. Um, again, do you need to worry about how is that calculated? No, but but what you need to really know is what metrics you should hit if you want to hit a certain ability, because that's what's important for you. Okay, but um, uh, but but again, if you want to know the math behind it, I'd be happy to to do that. We actually every GMAT strategy expert at eGMAT knows the math behind it. Uh, they do they do the probability calculation as well. So. So um, does the, the G so I have a bunch of questions over here, which uh, which are like, hey, which ability, which sections do we measure ability in? How do we go about measuring that ability? What about the first few questions? Are they important? I'm going to talk about each one of these questions on the next few slides. I'm going to delete these because I have these questions answered on the next few slides or so. So um, okay. So which abilities does the GMAT measure? So there are three abilities on the verbal side and two on the quant side overall. Um, now, there are a few things that you need to note overall. One is that each of these subsections is independent. So your SC ability and your CR ability are not intertwined. You may mess up on SC. If you're excellent in CR, you may, you'll may still get a high CR ability score. Uh, and same is true with RC as well. Similarly, on arithmetic and algebra, the, the same holds true. Okay. The, all of these subsections have equal weight. So, so it's not that RC is way more important than CR because RC has more questions than CR does. It's just that when it comes to the GMAT, um, uh, it, it needs about 9 to 10 questions to get a reliable estimate of your CR ability, whereas it needs more questions in RC. So the number of questions in, the, in each subsection is, is, is a function of how, how long does it take for the GMAT to, 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 or how many questions does it take for the GMAT to, to give a reliable, get a reliable estimate of that ability. Okay. There are multiple ways to achieve a 730. There are multiple ways to achieve a, a V34. Or a V40, and 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 depending on your natural strengths, your natural weaknesses, for each one of you, there's an optimum path to reach a 730 or reach a V40, uh, or a Q48 or a Q50, and 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 so each one of you needs to understand or get a uh, get a target ability in each subsection. By the way, let's kind of take one score 730. There are about 25 different ways. To, to achieve that 730 and you've got to figure out which one of those 25 is optimal for you. Why? Because that's going to be the shortest path 
and the path that you are most likely to achieve if you want to get to that target score okay now a few other one other thing the process of building ability which means if you are at 25 percentile in sc versus 25 percentile in number of properties the steps the sequence of steps the kind of steps that you take uh, remain the same whether you're talking about sc or number of properties uh, because why because it's about skill building that's the process of skill building it doesn't matter whether you're trying to build your skill in 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 playing tennis or or learning how to do do generative ai okay uh, in your starting points, and this should be starting. I don't know how this went to a uh, starting, but uh, your starting points in each subsection will likely be different. Again, that's where the personalized study plan comes in. Okay. So the second thing that I want you to write down is when you think about that target GMAT score, ask yourself what abilities am I aiming for? And what does that mean with regards to how much I need to what kind of effort do I need to put in each of these subsections? Okay. Um, now, as one more example of of, of um, uh, if two things. One is that you can go from a very low ability, B17, there's about 15 percent ability to a 91st percent ability, but also the fact that the GMATs are very forgiving tests. A student who went from B17 to B40, you can see this B40 is at 91st percent ability. This is the composition of those that 91st percentile, 94th percentile ability in SC, 73rd and 79th in CR and RC overall. Now, this is his attempt journey. Um, in the first block of about 10 questions, this guy got 90% of those questions correct. Then in the second block, as questions became more challenging, uh, he made a few more mistakes. He got he made 30% mistakes. But in the last two blocks, when when the test primarily served him extremely challenging questions, he he pretty much got half the questions right or slightly more than half and yet he was able to get a v40 overall so you can make mistakes on the test and get a very high score as long as you make mistakes on hard questions this is what we call as a build build maintain maintain strategy where you're building the you're you're proving to the test that hey you are at that evp level and then you're answering questions enough questions right that you maintain that question pickers um, question selection ability so that you continue to get those EVP level questions. Okay. Again, the takeaway is you can make mistakes as long as those mistakes are on hard questions. Okay. Do the first 10 questions matter? Should you approach them differently? And, and should you spend more time? So I want you to answer these questions as, as you know, these are all three of them are yes, no questions. So you can really say if you think uh, the answer to all three is y yes, yes, yes. So type Y, Y, Y. If you think it's Y and Y, uh, then type Y and Y. So if you want to say yes, no, so don't say N, no, just say yeah. What do you think is the, is the case? I love how, how many of you you're following directions. That's really good. Uh, Akshay, if you could, <coughs> excuse me, if you could put your 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 question in the in the short answer pod, that would be useful. Uh, rather than the Q and A pod, Q and A pod is for your questions and our answers. All right. Thank you for that participation. So so you can really see lots of people say Y N N. Some of you are saying Y Y Y. Uh, some of you are saying N N N. Let's see, do we have anything? I have YYN as well. Uh, okay, you can really see that. So so this is, and, and the reason why this is really important is again, as I say, when you answer those questions, you put a stake in the ground, you really say, this is what my opinion is now, whether I'm able to change your opinion or not, that's that 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 uh, we, we need to, to, to see. Okay, so do the first 10 questions matter? Yes, they do. Why? Because they place you in a certain difficulty bucket and that's kind of when the test does an initial estimation of your ability. So yes, they do matter. Um, should you approach them differently? No. As I said, you 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 ace or you you lose the, you, you fail on the test and during the preparation. Uh, your your actual attempt is just a representation of, of the abilities that you've built. And should you spend more time? No, that usually is counterproductive. And, and let me explain this. So, but but the answer are, is is Y, N, N. These are my answers to this. Okay. Um, so let's kind of look at this. Let's say you're a 90th percentile student overall. Okay. 
Uh, and and again, I'll I'll continue to go back to to that hiring example here. So and by definition, if you're a 90th percentile student during your preparation, what it means is you answer medium difficulty questions with 90% accuracy, you answer medium hard questions with 80% accuracy, and you answer hard questions with with 65% accuracy. Which means that you you get a third of uh, a third one third of hard questions incorrect, but you get very few medium questions incorrect. Now. Let's kind of look at this overall. So, so if the in the first ten questions, uh, if uh, you know your, your test is like a normal test, the majority of of the questions that you get are medium level, uh, and let's say you get eight medium level questions, you get answer seven out of those eight questions correctly. You know, clearly the interviewer would really say, "Hey, this guy needs to move up a notch." That's how the test behaves as well. Now, the problem is when you when you are extra cautious, and tell me if this has happened with anyone, if you ch if you change how you approach those questions, then this statistic no longer matters. This statistic essentially no longer holds true. There are times where a 90th percentile would go and uh, attempt medium questions. That person would be extra cautious and really choose the correct answer in the first go, and the person would be, let me go revise this. Let me make sure I, 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 I've, I've taken care of everything, and you'd end up choosing the wrong answer. How many of you have done this? You've tried to be extra cautious and mess things up by being extra cautious. Okay. And which is where if you pay special attention to some things, more often than not on the GMAT, you mess things up. In fact, in the eGMAT world, we call something... How many of you are Germans over here? Anyone from Germany or speaks German? Or from a process background? Okay. So German, Germany is known for uh, process engineering. It's known for manufacturing. And there's a term in Germany called tuck time, uh, or it's called T-A-K-T, tuck time. And essentially, when you think of you know building something and you, you kind of place items on an assembly line, um, every process step has its own sweet time. And that sweet time is called the tuck time for that particular step. If you give yourself less time than the tuck time for that process step, then you're prone to errors. But what research has shown is that if you give yourself but more time than the tuck time, so 20% more time or higher than the tuck time, you also do errors. And 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 and, and this is kind of where we call that, uh, 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 you know, your, your sweet time. So in, in the EGMAT platform in Scholarium, we measure your tuck time in, in, um, in, in, for every question type. If you try and pay special attention to those so certain set of questions, you spend more time and then that's where you know this, this chat is no longer 90 10 for some people it becomes 80 20 and for some it even goes down to 70 30 and, and that's kind of where you start to underperform okay so do the first 10 questions matter yes should you spend more time on them absolutely not why because usually then you'd underperform now there's a second school of thought that some of you have and tell me if 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 um, if 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 um, I'm wrong over here, some people think, "Hey, I'm not as good as hard questions in SC. Specifically, you know, I'm this is just making up an example, modifiers related questions which are hard difficulty level. But if I try and spend, you know, two and a half minutes or the ninety seconds on an SC question, I will have a, there's a higher likelihood that I would get that question right. So if by spending more time, they think that they're going to manufacture ability. In reality, that doesn't happen. It merely leads to wastage of time." Either you have that ability within your tuck time or you don't have it. By spending more time, you're no, long, no more likely to answer questions of a certain category correctly. In fact, if you spend more time on questions that you don't know, more often than not, you end up spending less time on questions that you actually know. Why? Because you have that finite amount of time and you start, you hurt yourself way more than, than, than you gain from it. Okay. So does that make sense? Yes, no? Or doubts about that? Okay. So I'm not saying spend less time. Just spend as much time as your tuck time is. That's all that is important overall. Okay. And and the other thing that I want to make sure is everyone makes mistakes. I mean, the uh, students have scored 780, 790. Um, uh, 
I think she was a, a, an Argentinian who scored 780 with a V47. She made mistakes on the verbal section. Uh, another 760 scorer um, uh, from, from Canada who scored a V47. Uh, he's currently studying at Booth. He made mistakes on his verbal section. It's just that the kind of questions that made, they made mistakes on, they were very different. They were more challenging. They, they These guys focused on building their ability and, and they didn't worry about about mistakes they, they they focused on making sure that they expressed their ability in the exam and and then um and they, they told themselves as long as we did that we know the score that we would get okay so takeaways focus on building ability and don't change the way you approach questions don't don't give the test uh any more importance than it needs okay so with that let's kind of talk about um Point number three over here, which is that hey, you need a target ability in every subsection. Okay, so that's let's talk about this. So I want you to tell me what does a study plan do? What's the job of a study plan? Write down the uh, your answer. And and while you do that. Manoj has a question. He says, just to clarify, the difficulty level increases gradually as you answer correctly and not randomly. Uh, more or less, Man Manov, yes. So, so essentially on the test, um, what they do is the question picker has what I call as a median difficulty level and a standard deviation around it and then picks the questions based on that median difficulty level. Now, some questions may be easier than the median difficulty level. Uh, some, many would be along the median difficulty level. And then there are some that may be, you know, really challenging again because of the, that probabilistic distribution. But yes, more or less, that's the case. And as it goes from one block to the other, it, it increases or decreases the median difficulty level based on, on how you performed in the prior block. It's, it's what we call as block level estimation. Okay. Akash has another question. It says, how many questions do we need to answer in both sections to get above 700? How many questions should you answer correctly? Akash, again, as I said, accuracy is a really bad measure uh, on the GMAT. But if you want to really just know, you know, out of 36 questions, so a lot depends on what's your target quantum verbal score. So hold on to that question and then um, we will, I'll answer that question after the study plan piece because um, I think that's going to be critical. All right, so my question, what 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 does a study plan do? What's the job of a study plan? And let's look at some of your answers. It's a structured approach, timeline and discipline um, to keep you organized and to be strategic, uh, to estimate efforts and finalize timelines. All right, that's good to achieve a goal in a given time, um, to declutter your brain, to tell you what to focus on, what not, to stay organized. That's good. So at each mat, you know, when we think about study plan and we when we try to answer this question, what does a study plan do? You know, we 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 kind of came with three jobs that a study plan should do. One is it should tell you how will you, as an individual, reach your target GMAT score. Okay, which means what's what what abilities in SCC or RC, arithmetic and algebra geometry are you aiming for given your starting points? That's the first goal. The second thing is given those ability gaps, how much time do you need to you need to to put in, in each of these subsections to fill those gaps and that's really important why because you know a lot of people really say hey my friend is sc in, in about eight days i think i'm going to budget eight days as well how many of you do that say my friend was able to improve uh, uh, spent eight days on sc or 10 days on sc and i'm going to be able to do that as well that's a good estimate for how long i would need okay Really bad idea to do it if you don't have similar starting abilities. <coughs> okay. The third thing, which I think is an even more important piece, is, is where do you put in that effort? You know, um, how much of that time is spent on uh, building foundations? How much of your time that time is spent on, on learning concepts, learning applications, cementing application, and then refining to perfection? There are kind of those, we call this five steps in learning, starting from building that foundation to refining for perfection. And depending on, on your current ability level, that distribution of time uh, varies tremendously. Okay. So to, to give you an example to really say, hey, how does a study plan does these three jobs? I'm going to 
compare and contrast two successful students who who were aiming for very similar scores had slightly different starting scores and you would really see how the answers to these three questions are different for these students so you're going to look at ayush and rafaela overall so let's start with rafaela rafaela started the egmat course she's uh, she's currently studying at harvard um, she started the egmat course she took we have this mock called a sigma x mock it's probably the world's most accurate mock um, uh, outside of the official gmat mocks um, and, and so she took um, her, her, her sigma x mock and and the beauty about sigma x mocks is it not only gives you your your gmat score your current quant and your current verbal estimate it also tells you your abilities so she took the sigma x mock and the test estimated these were as as a starting abilities overall when you look at these abilities what do you observe what are her strengths what are her weaknesses when you look at these abilities what do you observe quant is a weakness okay there's there something more specific that you want to really talk about quant and rc review foundation very good i i like how you're making those judgments right away and then that's the beauty of it when you get the right data making decisions uh, becomes a lot easier based on that data sc and cr are strengths the rest is weakness okay arithmetic and rc really good now when you think about this clearly these two are strengths you're on that 90th person that she's really good in these naturally good in this and some of you are and which is where uh, 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 understanding the starting abilities is really important um clearly quant's not as strong but even within quant arithmetic uh, algebra and geometry she's way better off than it are than in arithmetic again how do you make a decision between gmat focus edition versus the new gmat find to figure out the starting abilities and really say which one should you take okay so 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 that's something that is there so clearly weakness over here weakness over here and and somewhat weakness over here again remember these are starting abilities you're not supposed to get have super high abilities but you're not supposed to have super low abilities as well okay so what we do then is we really look at these abilities we get these abilities we we put these abilities in in um, we have an ai driven tool um it uh, called psp or personalized study planner what it looks at it is it looks at um, it has data from upwards of 10000 successful students uh, it has their esrs and based on starting abilities it can compute the shortest path to to that target gmat score so when you put that data in psp what psp did what it says let's kind of maintain the strengths you know you're already at that 90th percentile uh <clears throat> we want to make sure that we maintain that why because Uh, aiming for anything upwards of 90th percentile can be a bit risky on the gmat now if you do it you get 96 97 percentile that's good that's a bonus but let's not put that in our planning let's assume that we'll perform at 90th percentile then let's see what do we need to improve so then the first thing it did was it improved the algebra geometry remember from 49th to 283rd percentile and say okay algebra geometry seems to be a natural strength so let's kind of maximize it and then let's see whether we want to focus on on rc versus arithmetic then it says hey since sc and cr are natural strengths let's kind of um, it should be easier for this person to improve on rc why because you know you can't do really well in cr with, without having the ability to read so so let's leverage that ability and enhance rc which means that rafaela only had to improve her arithmetic to 57th percentile okay can you see how just by getting starting abilities and knowing how the test works you can be extremely strategic about these decisions now because she's aiming for that 57th percentile one direct inference that you can have is that she doesn't need to answer the most challenging questions in arithmetic she doesn't need to spend time spend her energy on doing that why because she's really strong in the other areas okay all right and that's why it's really important to be strategic about such decisions diana has a question how do you improve rc improves here diana i i'd be happy to answer this question i can reserve it towards the end because if i try and answer this now we will kind of uh, go on a segue okay so I'd be happy to do that uh, let's hold it till the end 
Now, once you have this piece over here, this then generates time estimates. It takes that input in there and, and generates time estimates to really say, given your starting ability and your target ability, how much time do you think you would need? Um, okay. So to really figure out how do you do time estimates and where you spend time, I want to give you a mini tutorial on how do you build ability. And, and Diane, it will probably answer your question as well. So at each EMAT, we follow what we call as the three stages of learning. The first stage is where you build a foundation, you learn concepts, and you learn application. These are three independent activities here. One is build a foundation. F means a foundation. Two is, is learn concepts. And three is, is learn application. And we kind of track each one of these within the EGMAT platform. That's stage one of learning. Stage two is when you master application. This is what we call as what do we call stage two? If you're an EG Math student, can you guys tell me? There's a name for stage two that we have. Cementing, yes. And the reason why we call it cementing is because when you do stage one, it's like you've built a wall with where you've assembled bricks on top of the other. And, and so it's a really strong wall. It can take on vertical force. But then you want to make sure that this wall stays still. Uh, for uh, when, when you when you get lateral force on it and which is where we go through the process of cementing in other words once you study sc you have good scores in, in 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 stage one you do cementing and then as you move from sc to rc um what you're going to find is you're not going to lose your sc ability the sc ability stays there why because you've cemented and once you've cemented you will then refine to perfection okay so what's your ability at the end of each stage when you learn concepts and application, if you do a good job, you improve up to 55th percentile ability. When you do cementing, at a bare minimum, you improve to 70th percentile. You may improve to 80th, 90th as well, depending on your cementing scores. But the graduation of cementing is that 70th percentile point. And then when you refine to perfection, this is where we have those custom study plans where, where we work with you work with an uh, expert. Uh, uh, you, that's where our LMP program is, where we help you improve to that 70% to 90th percentile or so. Okay. So depending on the, we're still with Rafaela right now. And, and, and essentially what we have is a legend. We're going to really look at various subsections and, and we'll say, which stages does she need to focus on? So if you see this tick mark over here, this means that she need not study. Why? Because her innate ability exists. This is why she needs to focus on. And, and when you see this part over here, this means that she need, this is something that she's not supposed to do because she's not targeting as high an ability. Okay. So this is her, her chart that looks like an SCCR and RC she pretty much has all of this. This has an innate ability. So, so she needs to focus on maintaining that. In RC, in SC and CR, sorry, not RC. In RC, she needs to start with stage one, then do stage two, and then she needs to maintain that. Okay. Similarly, in arithmetic as well as in algebra, where she also needs to refine to perfection. Does that make sense when you look at this overall? Take a look at this over here. And this is something that you can make on day one of your preparation right away. Day one, you can do this. Well, as long as you have your, your starting ability scores, your target scores. You can take this template, build it. Yep. Uh, the test is called a Sigma X mock. Let me share a link with you if you guys want to uh, look at that. Here's a link to a Sigma X mock. Okay, we offer one mock free of charge, and then you get four other mocks with a paid subscription. Of course, and then call any offers you but enough questions that you can build 20 mocks from them. Okay, Ayush, this guy improved from a, a 670 to a, a, to, to a, a 750. So um, so again, he took a start, took the uh, Sigma X mock, got his starting abilities. What do you observe from starting abilities? What are his strengths? What are his weaknesses? SC and CR are weaknesses, yes. And what are his strengths? Oh, 
quantum RC, yes. Okay, so we put this data in there in, in PSP and this is what the test generated. It says, hey, let's kind of um, keep the, 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 the quant piece over here at uh, at 83% at at itself because that's equivalent to a Q50. We don't want to get to a Q51. So because this guy wanted to score a 750, uh, it first improved his RC ability, improved that to 90 plus percentile, then focused on improving his SC ability, and then said, hey, you don't need to get to a 90th percentile in CR. You only need to get to an 84th percentile also. Only is probably not the right word, but, but you don't need to get to a 90th percentile in CR. Okay. So then... Accordingly, it, it created those time estimates and created the same map for him where you can see in quant, he needs to focus on maintaining. In RC, he needs to kind of, we wanted him to do cementing again and then refine to perfection because we truly wanted him to get to the 94th percentile. But clearly, a majority of his time was spent on, on SC and CR. Okay. Now, when you look at Ayush versus Rafaela, two different individuals, um, they have different needs, and even though their target scores are very similar, their starting scores are similar, but but what they learn and how much time they spend, that, that's really different overall. So for Ayush, who for him, SC was his weakness. He had to spend about three weeks of dedicated effort in SC to achieve that 94th percentile, whereas Rafaela only had to maintain that. So that was just about two days overall. Um, and similarly, in CR, he had to spend about two weeks. Rafaela purely had to maintain it. In RC, Rafaela had to spend twice as much time at least um, as, as, as I used it. In arithmetic, Rafaela had to spend two weeks of dedicated effort as well as in algebra where she had to spend two weeks of dedicated effort in, 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 uh, in, in doing this. And you can really see this is really important. Why? Uh, because both Rafaela and Ayush, um, where they spent time and, and how much time they spent, were, it was very, very different. For Rafaela, you know the the thing which was there was uh, that 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 you start from basics uh, in in arithmetic, algebra, and RC, whereas for Ayush it was purely stage three of learning, and and uh, and which was just the opposite in SC and CR. Now, this is a great question. Over it. What if some questions are pure luck in the mock test, and that could happen? Let me just say this. So typically, what we do when we find someone with a really high ability in a mock test is we ask them to take cementing quizzes and, and, and if they're not able to replicate their performance, then, then that's something which is there. So everything that we do at EGMAT, there's a double confirmation for it. For those of you who do cementing, how many medium cementing do, quizzes do you need to take to pass cementing? For those of you who know that? Two, three. Yes, you have to take, take three medium and three hard. It's triple confirmation around it. We don't really... We're never satisfied with one data point. So, so, so in in cementing, let's say you were do, you were to do cementing in number of properties, you'll have to achieve a, a seventy percent accuracy in three medium cementing quizzes and a fifty five percent accuracy in three hard cementing quizzes. Similarly, if you take, get a high ability in a mock test, we'll have you go through the cementing quizzes and really just say, hey, if you have a high ability in 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 SC, does it? You then you should really pass through uh, cementing really easily. In NSC as well. And if you're not able to do that, then you go back. You, you readjust. The beauty of this is all of this can be is done within the first two days. How do you do maintenance? So that's where cementing is really useful. That's where um, you know if you uh, build an error log the way we recommend you to. So so every EGMAT course has an error log module. So if you build an error log as as we ask you to do so, uh, then then before you you so there are three things to it. One is you do cementing. When you pass cementing, those concepts stay in your brain. You do not lose them. The second is there are certain rough edges that you still have, and and and, and that's where before when you let's say go from SC to RC and you want to come back to SC, you revise your error logs. And if you if you still feel that hey you're not as confident of of getting back to it, write to us. We have specific what we call as getting back quizzes, which we can really. Uh, create for you. And this is where um, EGMAT's Collinium platform allows you to, to, to build those confidence building quizzes, uh, which you probably need about four hours to take. And, and, and then you can get back to it. But again, if you've done cementing, you're not going to lose it. That's the whole concept of cementing. Okay. Does that answer, answer your question? It's a great question.
Okay. Really important to do this. Really, really important to do this overall. And 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 for those of you who 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 are not EG, if you're an EG student, you have access to the system. You can run through the system uh, 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 again and again and again and again. Uh, but if you're not a part of this, this uh, if you're not an EG Math student, if you want to get a study plan, take a Sigma X mock. You can book a, book a call with one of our, our strategy experts and uh, and 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 essentially. Um, uh, uh, you know, get a study plan overall. <coughs> Excuse me. So, a lot of people aim for really high scores early on, uh, but then as they prepare for the test, they, 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 you know, their motivation dies. They, they, they hear these things that hey, you don't really need a seven hundred to uh, to get to a high uh, to get to a top B school. There are folks who get to a top B school. Uh, with a lower score as well, and 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 essentially, um, with with after having put in two months and uh, after having not reached that seven thirty, seven forty, seven sixty score, many people tend to or or, or get into that 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 give up mode. How many of you have heard people say, "Hey, GMAT score, want to get to a top school, and you can do that with a seven hundred, six ninety, uh, seven thirty is not essential." Blah 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 blah. Okay, yes, those statements are correct. But when you look at the stats behind those statements, you'd more or less see that that 730 is, is or higher is essential. So at EGMAT, we deliver, you know, three out of five 700 plus scores reported on GMAT Club. So we have a large pool of students who um, who we can tap into who've gotten really high GMAT scores and, and we can ask them how their MB outcomes were. So in 2021, we, we did this research where we reached out to people um, who who had their scores in in the 692 to 780 bucket? All of them were EG matters. These are to about 700 odd students. And, and the, the beauty about this was that um, because they were EG matters, because they were all connected with me on LinkedIn, and, and there are upwards of 20,000 students are connected with me on LinkedIn. But we could only reach out to the last year, year and a half months that I knew of. So 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 we knew their backgrounds. We knew which country they belonged to. We knew which schools they went to. And, and 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 so we reached out to them and and we just said, tell me which schools did you apply to? Where did you get an admission? Did you get a scholarship? And so on and so forth. And and as we did this, uh, because we had you know these these five hundred odd students, we could really get some statistical uh, statistically significant uh, results. So first is M seven schools. So what we found was that most M seven admits had a seven forty or higher. And in fact, if you look at M seven admits from India. I would say 90% of M7 admits are at 740 or higher. Okay. But the other thing which was there was that the acceptance rate of folks who had a 740 or higher was about 28%, which was twice as much as the acceptance rate of folks in that bucket. So it's not that you know 700 to 730 is, is hopeless. It's just that this one doubles your chances of getting into an M7 school, which I think is incredible. Okay. The second piece which was there was, you know, scholarships. What does that lead to? So, so 45% <coughs> of, of M7 to admits who had a score of 740 plus got a scholarship. 82% of T20. T20 is top 20 schools in the US um, that are outside of M7. So there is these are all mutually exclusive segments. 82% um, of them got a scholarship. And if you think about it, you know, in the world where interest rates are super high, in a world where US dollar is, is, is at its highest that it has ever been, this is incredible. Overall, 62% of M7 and T20 admits uh, got scholarships. Okay. The other piece that we found was, we, and this is the research that we really wanted to do and we had to work really hard because we needed to find a statistically significant sample. And, and and so we said, what's the delta between someone who gets a 760 or higher versus someone who gets a 740? Okay. So 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 those were the, 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 the only two groups that we compared. And people who had a 740 had a median scholarship of 55K. People who had a 760 or higher had a median scholarship of 90K. So which means that, that those 20 points are worth $35,000 or so. And when you look at these, these are incredible stats. Okay. 
I have two really good questions over here. Does the scholarship solely depend on the GMAT score or were there other reasons? So we've asked, I've asked this question to admission officers um, as we meet them at AGAC conferences and as, as they visit schools. In fact, uh, just four days ago, I was um, I was on a pleasure trip uh, in, in Europe and um, and I happened to have a pit stop in, in London. So I said, let's, I've never visited uh, uh, said uh, Oxford. So let me go and visit Oxford. And then I... Uh, uh, I was talking to their um, uh, to their head of uh, uh, Center for Careers Division, who focused primarily on consulting, and and what that guy said was that um, that that essentially, you know, and this is said said is a European school it doesn't have an incredibly high GMAT score, but he said if you want to work in New York or London, you may must have a 700 uh, or higher score on the GMAT. Those guys look at that uh, overall. Now, what do scholarships depend on? They typically depend on two things. Um, one is your GMAT score. The second is your likability during the interview. Okay, If you're likable during the interview, if your GMAT score is high, you will get a scholarship. Does that answer the first question? The second question, can everyone score a 760? Uh, my answer to this is yes. In, in, in fact, uh, if you're connected with me on LinkedIn, you'd see some posts. Um, uh, uh, that that I'd be posting more about what. So when you think about seven six, it's about achieving peak performance, and uh, and and there is a lot of research that really says, hey, but purposeful effort and purposeful means iterative, where you're you're monitoring your metrics, you're you're focusing on 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 putting in effort in areas where you need help. With purposeful practice, uh, everyone can achieve excellence in their field. It's not just about that GMAT score. It, it's about uh, being um, one of the best violin players or 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 being one of the best coders. And it's not just about those 10,000 hours of effort. It's about 10,000 hours of purposeful effort. That's something that's important. So can everyone score a 760? Absolutely. Will everyone need to put in the same amount of effort to score a 760? No. You know, there are some people who'd find that scoring a 760 is about two months worth of effort. Others for others, it'd be about six to eight months worth of effort. For some, it'll be about four months. Why? Because each one of you, as you've seen over here, has a different starting point. Okay, but yes, everyone can score a 760. How many hours on an average is required for achieving a 730 plus score? I don't have an answer to this for you because... Oh, I can give you an on average. Um, if I look at on average, actually, I have an answer. The average person starts at a 590, um, and, and to, to get to a 760 is about, you know, 170 hours of effort. So you can say about 12, 12 and a half hours of effort for every 10 points of improvement. Um, but again, there's there are assumptions built into it. One is your starting score. The second is the fact that you can put those... Uh, <coughs> One, 170 hours with what I call as 85% consistency, which means, yes, you know, you may take some small breaks, but those breaks are only taken during strategic intervals. These 170 to 180 hours are otherwise a continuum of hours. Okay. And the third is that you're putting in good pockets of time, which means you're putting in about an hour and a half to two hours every day of high quality effort where you're not distracted, you're not watching YouTube. Uh, and then if you are that disciplined, then yes, 170 hours is a really good estimate. But if those assumptions don't hold true, that's when those those, those 170 stretch to 350, 400 overall, where people go in and go and revise those that, that piece of content multiple times. Could I elaborate more on refine to perfection step in prep? Um, I would do that. Just hold on. Yes. So, so hold on to this uh, thought, but towards this. Again, examples of people. So how many of you over here are subscribed to our YouTube channel? If you're subscribed to our YouTube channel, what you would really see is we post two interviews every week without fail. We post two YouTube interviews and our EGMAT's YouTube channel is the world's largest collection. Of, of GMAT success stories. In fact, you take EG Math's YouTube channel, count the number of success stories out there, they're all, they're all in a playlist, and you look at every other GMAT prep company in the world, count the number of success story interviews there, 
and and even then they would not even amount to half as many as we do okay and and the reason about this is why because you asked this question can everyone get to that 760 as you watch those journeys you would see 760 scorers you'll see 780 scorers you'll also see 710 scorers and you'd see the similarities in their journey you'd also really see the difference is why someone's gotten to a 760 um, versus the other person has you know remained at a 710 and what you would find is more often than not it's the person's motivation not the set of tools available to them um, you know both 760 scorers and 710 scorers if you're in the egmat uh, universe you have the same set of tools same amount of support um, uh, 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 same learning content available to you the 710 scorer was happy with that 710 and there's nothing right or wrong with it. It's that's what their aspiration is. The other thing that you would really see is how these tools are way more make make your make your preparation way more structured. They give you the 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 insights and and empower you to to plan your next stage of preparation to track your progress. You'd be able to see all of that as well. Okay. Now here's a guy Victor Makula who who improved to a 770. Uh, you can watch his journey. This guy got multiple full rides. Um, okay, uh, he used data and analytics. So as you watch his interview, you're gonna really see that he improved to V44. This guy is from Tanzania. Okay, um, he spent about I think $600 on his GMAT prep, <coughs> and he got about 350k worth of scholarship. So, so again, incredible journey, and, and he took the GMAT three times to get there. So, so, so again, if you think about persistence, that's incredible persistence. Okay, another guy, Kong Bui, and these are people who are. And the reason why I have these is we have people who who, who get there in, in a month, two months. In fact, we have more journeys, uh, more folks who get there in one month to two months than, than anyone else has. But these are stories of persistence, and which is why I've put in over here. This is another incredible um, story, which which I absolutely love. Um, so, so this guy, if you watch his interview, there are a few things that you would observe. One is that um, that, that Kong Bui doesn't speak perfect english okay uh, the second is he his execution was absolutely flawless he followed the study plan he hit all the metrics he knew what he needed to do when and uh, and, and 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 he devoted a you know really high quality time in in preparing and that's something which was which was really important now this guy got multiple full fellowships he got five full rides uh, and he got a special full fellowship from ohio fisher where they paid him seventeen hundred dollars a month stipend to study. So, so not only was his was his education completely covered, he got a monthly stipend to be there. This was, by the way, more money than um, than he earned uh, prior to his starting his MBA. Yeah, again, four full rides upwards of uh, five full rides upwards of scholar five hundred k of scholarship. Uh, again, didn't have any extracurriculars overall and 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 the beauty of this is he knew what he needed to do at every stage and he executed on it perfectly he iterated till he achieved uh, the metrics that he needed to hit that was there there's another student uh, who who um, uh, i think this she was um, in uh, an lsr graduate she got a 750 on the gmat if i remember correctly she got multiple m7 admits and uh, and and she got 180k in uh, in total scholarships Okay, and again, if you go on our YouTube channel, we have an admits and 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 scholarships page where you have upwards of ten million dollars worth of 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 uh, MBA and GMAT journeys over there. Okay, all right, and and which is why you know when you when you when when you have people who are persistent, when you give them the right tools, if they put in the effort, uh, you, you they achieve success that's something which is absolutely there and and the beauty about giving people tools is if you educate people on what's right versus what's wrong what is the measure of success versus what's not even when they're not succeeding they reach back to us and then we can guide them and which is why over the since 2021 we've delivered three out of five 700 plus scores reported on gmat club which means if you look at the stats on gmat club and gmat club does a fantastic job of organizing those scores chronologically so you can verify these numbers since 2021, we've accounted for 60% of all success, whereas everyone else combined has accounted for 40% overall. And you can see Target Test Prep, uh, Manhattan Prep, um, GMAT Wells, Crack Verbal, and so on and so forth. Or so. Okay. And not only that, we've also 
since 2021, when we launched our Quant 2.0, a lot of people know us for our verbal, but we've delivered more Key 49 Plus course than anyone else has. Okay, as well as more five-star reviews. Okay, and you should check this out um, overall. Okay, so someone asked this question: Is uh, do you need to solve the official guide, or is the EGMAT course enough? EGMAT course is enough, but but again, we ask people to do just the hard questions when they go through refine through, through perfection, and and the reason for that is it just gives people that confidence. Do you need to do it? Absolutely not. Okay, but but people need that confidence right after this. We say, hey, I understand I'm doing well on Scalinium. I want to practice the official guide as well, and that's when we say, hey, if you're done with SC, practice a day, solve hard questions in SC. That's don't worry about medium questions, and then when people hit the same stats. <laughs> Um, that they had in Scalinium on hard questions in SC and, and from the official guide, they're really happy. Okay, so what have we learned so far? We've learned a bunch of these things so far. We've talked about, hey, why is that 730 important? Why is the GMA the test? One of the most important things that I want you to take away. And why do we need a personalized study plan? And then we also touched upon the four stages of learning and one stage of, of, of maintenance. Okay. Now, we want to talk about executing that study plan. I want to make sure that you, you guys are not stuck at a score plateau. Okay. How do you avoid silly mistakes? Don't call them silly mistakes, first of all. Okay. Uh, uh, you, you, and, 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 you, and that's one of those things that goes in the EGMAT format of error log. That, that, that's it. I mean, you track that. Uh, if you go through the error log module that we have at the end of every course, you'll be able to really figure that out. But don't call them silly mistakes or, or or careless mistakes. They are mistakes because of lack of focus. So I want to talk about why do people get stuck? And, and a lot of that is about how they approach things. So I'm going to compare two groups here. One is a 60th percentile group, people who get stuck at 60th percentile. And the other is the 90th percentile group. Now, if you're at 60th percentile, about 200,000 people who take the GMAT every year or probably till about two years back. Uh, about 200,000 people took the GMAT, which means if you are at the 60th percentile, you're among the top 80,000 folks. If you're at the 90th percentile, you're among the top 20,000 folks. Now, we're talking only in the context of SC. A 60th percentile student, who's a person who's stuck at 60th percentile, spends 40 hours studying SC and arrives at 60th percentile. A 90th percentile student, also does this spends the same 40 hours arrives at 90th percentile okay the starting ability for both of them is, is same and their capability is also very very similar similar capability is, is is something where a lot of people really say hey when they don't improve uh they 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 blame it on 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 their capability they say hey these this other guy is innately smart I am not as smart. And that's why I, I'm not going to, I'm not able to do that. How many of you do that? You blame your lack of, 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 of um, success to, to really just saying, hey, I'm not as capable. This other guy is smarter. Okay. Most of you, most of you, have similar capability. You may have different starting points, but when it comes to the capability, which is which is the amount of gray matter in your head, the fact that how fast can your neurons connect, how fast can you learn compared to someone else, it's it's very very similar. Okay, um, there's one book that I can recommend that you read. It's it's a book called Peak. It's by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole. It's a fantastic book about about expertise. Uh, read that. I mean, it's one book where uh, uh, which it's not very expensive, but if you read that book, you know, you, you do yourself um, uh, uh, justice to your talent. That's something that I would say. Peak, yes. It says, Peak Secrets from the New Science of Expertise by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole. Okay. And the reason why I'm talking about this is when you're aiming for that 730 you, or 760, 770, you are talking about peak performance. Okay, You are talking about perfection. 
and that is 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 really really important and and, and for you to understand that 90th percentile is about achieving perfection now as you look at this over here 60th versus the 90th percentile student um how do they really look at this a 60th percentile student really says hey gmat sc is about mastering these error types um okay uh, and these error types are in these groups overall a 60th percentile says hey i'm going to use splits i'm going to look at the differences in 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 on options and and i'm only going to focus on meaning when splits don't work for me a 60th percentile student while learning gets between 7 to 10 feedback points and a 60th percentile student and remember we're still talking about this person who has put in these 40 hours okay started at a 30th percentile put in these 40 hours a 60th percentile student spends about 30 percent of that those 40 hours learning and 70 percent of those 40 hours solving questions okay in the context of sc how many of you identify with this guy Okay. All right, that's good. Now you're gonna really see how a 90th percentile student looks at this. But while I do that, uh, we, one of our students at Purva is saying, my mentor has been helping me, but I feel that the plans are overwhelming as I'm unable to complete with them. Apurva, uh, thank you for bringing that point over here. Uh, if you can write those to me, if you can send me those plans, I'd be happy to help. Okay. And again, this is not complaining. We are here to help you. So, so if you have a problem that you're unable to do so, as long as you give us enough insights as to why you're not able to complete those plans, we'd be happy, able to adjust those. And this is where this experience helps us. Okay. Now, a 90th percentile student looks at this very differently. A 90th percentile student really says, hey, GMAT SC is about mastering sentence structures. Why? Because sentence correction is essentially about meaning. And, 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 and so that person, rather than focusing on these error types, yes, the person learns these error types, but this person also focuses on learning the, the major sentence structures uh, uh, that are there. And there are about 200 sentence structures that GMAT SC tests. And, 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 and that particular student looks at mastering those sentence structures and their impact on um, on on, um, on on essentially the meaning piece for them meaning is not an error type meaning is the way they approach these questions they look at at least 10 times as much feedback uh, as they're preparing and and they adjust their preparation based on their feedback and overall because of this because they're iterating based on that feedback they they spend 60% of their time learning 40% of their time practicing in fact even though these guys spend 40% of the, just 40% of those, so those 40 hours pure pra, while practicing, uh, while doing pure practice, they spend 50% more time revising each question. So why? Because they get way more insights from it. So when you look at the journey of a 60th percentile student versus that of a 90th percentile student, you'd see that it's, it's a very, very different journey. It's a very different focus. It's the same 40 hours here, 40 hours here, it's the same 30th percentile starting ability here and here, but how they manifest, how they utilize those 40 hours, um, how they make decisions during those 40 hours, the extent to which they trust the process during those 40 hours, those are very, very different. Okay. So I'm going to demonstrate that piece overall, and I'm going to give you a question which I want you to solve. Again, my goal here is not to teach you sentence correction, but my goal here is to illustrate how should you think about uh, solving this question? Okay. So the, the thing that I want to do is I want to give you ample time. So because I don't want to time you, I want you guys to choose this choice which says still solving. Uh, I want about 30, 35 of you to choose still solving. And when you and then that way, when you choose an option other than still solving, I know that you guys are done, and that's when I would call time. 30 people to say still solving before I show the question. I have 16, 17. Can I get 30 people to say still solving, please, guys? 21, 24, 29, and one more. 30. Good. I'm going to remove broadcast results. 
Here is the question. Good luck, guys. All right, guys, 80% of the group is done. Let's get those answers in. I'm going to give you another 15 seconds. Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll and broadcast the results. So you can really see pretty much all of you were done, but uh, only about two people uh, were in that still solving pool. Uh, but but most of you were done, and and you can see what we have is a split here. We have two choices, the uh, four choices that have significant votes. So B, D, and E are more or more or less equally distributed, and then choice C is the most popular choice. Let's look at this, and then when you think about solving this question using the splits approach, especially as as we solve this question. What I want you to think about is, you know, how you approach this versus how I am, am, am approaching this. Okay, when you look at the splits approach, there are many splits that it, that that exist. You know, there there are there are four options with which have a contrast word but in there. Uh, choice C does not have that. When it comes to the beginning, you have the church coined in two options, and you have while in two in two options, and then you have this this weird that over here. Um, and then there are other, you know, a bunch of sentence structures that you can see in, in all of this. Okay, let me hide this. Let me bring in the short answer part so we can communicate. All right. Here's the short answer part here. 
Okay. So it's really difficult to really to solve this question using the splits approach. Now the meaning based approach works beautifully here. The meaning based approach works beautifully on, on, on every SC question, even where you, you have a clear set of splits. Okay. So one of the first things that we do in the meaning based approach is to really pause strategically and really figure out, hey, what is the what job is this sentence supposed to do? What meaning is it supposed to communicate? And and when you do this, and again, as I said, my goal is not to teach you um, the entire uh, aspect of SC. We have an SC session for that. Um, but but here is the original sentence. This is what we call as the sentence structure of it. The church coined the date February 14th as Valentine's Day. Why, why did they coin it? With an ulterior motive to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercalia or Lupercalia. Uh, that aspect is claimed by a few experts. But it is celebrated on this date to honor uh, why is it celebrated? To honor the anniversary of Valentine's death or burial. That is the more prevalent belief. Okay. So when you think about this, one of the first things you really just say is, hey, we the, the author wants to communicate two different claims about why February 14th is celebrated as Valentine's Day. Then the second aspect is, you know, claim one is by the church and it, the church had a certain motive when it designated it as Valentine's Day. Claim two is... Is, is essentially to honor the anniversary of uh, 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 St. Valentine's death or burial. Now, the third aspect is claim one is by entity one, and that entity one is a few experts. Claim two is the more prevalent belief. Now, these are the three things that the author wants to communicate using this. Okay, How many of you were able to, to uh, identify all three while solving the question? And if you weren't able to identify all three, or if you were, if you were able to, if you were unable to identify even one or more, um, select them. You can you can choose one, two, and three. You can choose two and three. This is a multiple response question, so you can choose multiple options overall. And the beauty of this is, as you can really see, you know, aspect three is the most common thing that people did not focus on, and you can really see when people don't focus on something it leads to them making a mistake. And people who did not focus on, on, on aspect three chose a particular choice and then they know which choice they chose. But, but this is very, very predictable. Aspect three was the most ignored aspect. Now, what feedback, if you, if you, if you, if you ignored aspect three or one of these aspects uh, while, choosing the, while solving this question, what feedback will you give to yourself? What will you tell yourself? What's the corrective action here? Type that corrective action. The simple correct, and it's, it's it's not rocket science. First of all, can you see all of these aspects when you read this particular question here, the, the original question stem? Can you see that each one of these aspects aspects exist? Now, if you ignored it. Then the feedback that you have to tell yourself is, hey, while reading the original question stem, make sure you extract all the aspects. Okay. And, and how do you do that? By, form a, by forming a relationship between different elements, as this particular individual has said, and the meaning. Write down or create a mental map of it. But again, spend effort, put in effort to, to, to do that. that. That's really important here. So, simple corrective action in this case. We've already done that. If you did all three, then great job in understanding the meaning. You should have gotten this question right. If you focus on one or in most likely, if you got all three, you would have gotten this right. In fact, um, we've done this um, uh, statistical differential analysis where uh, people who get all three, their accuracy on this question is about 70%. People who, of course, if you don't get all three, then that accuracy goes down to about 20%. And those 20% who get this right, are they get it right by luck. Okay. And play the pauses while reading. Very good. That's I really like that. Okay. Now, once we figure out what the sentence wants to communicate, let's kind of figure out the errors over here. And one of the first things that you really just see is these two verbs over here do not have subjects. We have missing subjects overall. And, and, and that is the error. And that's another piece that you really see. If you weren't able to figure this out, 
learn the sentence structure approach so that you can figure out you can map the subject verbs you can see the subject verbs are over here it is celebrated the church coined so so and when you see you see there's a verb here there's no subject corresponding to this now that we have this meaning analysis let's kind of take it to to answer choices this is choice b choice b really says while with an ulterior motive to christianize so actually even before i analyze this this is your original choice and you have aspect one two and three over here the choice he says while with an ulterior motive to christianize the pagan celebration of lupercalia a few experts do claim so in choice b again remember choice b who has the ulterior motive it's a few experts in the original meaning who had the ulterior motive it was the church because of this choice b was wrong can you see people who chose choice b can you see why choice b is wrong people who chose choice b can you see that yes no there we had about 14 15 people who chose choice b again this is not a this is a no risk environment no one's judging you but you have to really give yourself feedback and if you chose choice b you know your your, your focus is 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 on on the meaning there's no gram, nothing grammatically wrong in this this choice actually corrects the the, the 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 missing subject error unfortunately it adds the meaning error to it okay let's look at choice e the most popular so choice this is also wrong while a few experts claim that the church coined blah 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 as valentine's day with an ulterior motive their more prevalent belief why is this choice wrong which aspect does it falter on aspect three yes this guy over here both the claims are made by the same group in in choice c this is not what the author intended to communicate it's a beautiful choice the language is really elegant but it distorts the meaning and again you can see 40 percent of you chose choice c And, uh, and 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 you can see where you made the mistake here are your choices miss there okay again is there a grammatical correction that you need to do no it's about meaning okay there's no complex grammatical co grammar concept that that's out here that you need to worry about at least not in choices b or c Okay. Question. Let's let's look at choice D, D for Delta. Okay. The church coined the date February 14 to, to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercalia as claimed. I'm going to talk about this, this really nuanced use of as over here. Um and 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 uh, and this nuanced use of is, I'm going to map this to that as well. This is a really subtle meaning change. And this is something that is tested on 700 level questions in SC, as well as it is tested in RC overall. Okay. Now, let's kind of look at this sentence over here. Apple is the market leader is claimed by Forbes magazine. Okay. Um, now, when you say this, are you communicating information over here? Yes, no. Well, you are. You're telling Apple is the market leader. Are you making a claim here? No, you're not making the claim here. You're merely saying, hey, Forbes magazine says Apple is the market leader. You're not saying Apple is the market leader. Forbes magazine is saying Apple is the market leader. And should you be blamed if it turns out that Apple is not the market leader? Absolutely not. This part is clear? Now, let's not change this is to as and see what happens. Apple is the market leader as claimed by Forbes magazine. In this case, are you communicating information? Absolutely. Yes, prior to reading the sentence, uh, you know, you didn't know whether Apple is the market leader. Are you communicating, making the claim here? Yes, you are backing Apple's claim, uh, uh, Forbes claim by saying, 
by using the word as over here. And if it turns out that Apple is not the market leader um, as, as is claimed, then you will share that blame. When you tell someone, buy Google as recommended by Wall Street Journal, you are backing Wall Street Journal's recommendation. Okay, so when you use as over here, you are backing that claim. Okay, now in the original choice, the author was merely communicating information. But in choice D, the author is backing both claims. As claimed by a few experts, the author is backing that. And but its celebration on this day is to honor the blah, 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 the more prevalent belief. By using this is over here, the author is also backing the second claim. Both of them were not intended. And this is something which is a big meaning change. It's tested in SC. It is tested in a big way on GMAT RC as well. How many of you have seen this test written inference question in RC where, where you can say, what is it that you can infer? What you can infer on the uh, on, on GMAT RC is, is what the author claims and what the author believes in, not what the author merely communicates. Okay. Again, really important. That's a nuanced thing. That leads us to the last choice, which is the correct choice. That the church coined the date February 14 with an ulterior motive, blah, 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 is claimed by a few experts again. But the more prevalent belief is it is celebrated on this date to honor the anniversary of Valentine's death or burial. Okay. A lot of people reject this answer choice. Why? Because they say, hey, how the hell is the sentence starting with that? I've never heard this. The second thing is a lot of people say, I need a that over here. This is There's a missing connector here. And some people really look at this and say, this is claimed as passive. Passive is wrong. How many of you rejected choice E because of one of these three reasons? Which one? Reason two. All right. For those of you who rejected this because of reason two, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We recently posted uh, 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 a video on our YouTube channel. When can you skip that? Let me actually see if I can get you that video. This is not just one scenario. There are a multiple uh, scenarios in which you can skip that. Let me share this over here. Those of you who did this, you can watch this link overall. When can you skip that? We've this is by one of our, our SMEs. Okay. Again, a lot of people think you can't start a sentence with that. A lot of people think. Uh, uh, that is claimed as passive. Passive voice is absolutely fine on the GMAT. Okay. Being is absolutely fine. How many of you think that being an answer choice that contains being is wrong? How many of you think that? Yeah, being is used. I mean, in 2012, we we wrote an article why being is correct because just someone was 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 propagating this week that piece that hey if you see being an answer in an SC answer choice rejected that isn't the case we actually gave statistical evidence as to give five examples where being was used in the correct answer choice in GMAT SC okay now each one of these answer choices the reason why people rejected this because they failed to to observe either the sentence structure issue or the meaning distortion it's not about the grammar. Okay. 
when it comes to 700 level SC, it's about me meaning. It's about sentence structure. It's about how these sentence structures map to one another to get the right meaning. And when you learn that, you would get the answer correct every time. One of the other things that you would really notice with each of these answer choices is we rejected each one of these with 100% confidence. There was no ambiguity. We didn't really say, hey, choice E is better than choice C. You know, which and, and the reason I want to make sure that you understand that is because the moment you start saying, hey, choice E is better than choice C, people who chose choice C start giving themselves a pat on their back because they will say, hey, if choice E weren't there, then probably they would have gotten it right. How many of you do that when you, when you hear an expert say E is better than this? No, choice C is wrong, independent of whether choice C E exists or not. Choice D is wrong, independent of whether choice E exists or not. And that's how GMAT, the GMAT is. It's, it's that precise with regards to right versus wrong. It's that deterministic. And that's the level of confidence, the level of determinism that you need to have for every SCC or NP geometry probability question that you solve. If you truly want to get to that 730 score. And, and that's where um, you, 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 you want to make sure that when you solve questions, you revise them to this degree. What difficulty level would I put such questions? And these are, this is a 700 level question. I mean, only what, 20% of the people got it right? This is a 700 level question. Okay. The other piece that I want, and the primary purpose of this was, can you really just see the, the interplay between sentence structures in just one question? There were many sentence structures uh, uh, that were there. Okay. Uh, discount for correct answers. But, but again, uh, let's just go back to this. Can you see the interplay between various sentence structures just in this one question overall? Yes, no, or I'm tired, lots of information. Okay, discount for correct answers, uh, no. I mean, I'd rather support you better because then, you know, you, uh, I can give you a $20 discount, but but I think you'd be better served if I helped you get 20 more points. You'd get tens of thousands of dollars of scholarship and you'd stay connected with me throughout your life, like many of our students. Right? That makes more sense, right? Rather than a discount. Okay. Now, when it comes to that 90th percentile, you know, you have to, to start from the very foundation, which means you need to learn that sentence structure. You need to learn the concepts. You need feedback during this time. And this is where that feedback's really important. Okay. Then you need to learn the method. Then you need to get that feedback. Then you need to get that refinement. And that's when you need to get that feedback overall. Okay. Really, really important in this case. All right. Um, and, and, and you can really see how that feedback comes in over here. This is really, really, really critical. Now, a lot of this feedback is automated today, which is where, you know, when you look at this as a student who says, I've subscribed, but there's no mentor yet. That mentor comes in only towards the last stage because only when you get to that last stage, that's when the feedback that you need is extremely personalized over here. There is no human being, frankly, even if we wanted to, there's no human being who can give you feedback at this stage. Why? Because at this stage, you need feedback every 30 minutes. You need feedback in real time. When you've learned a subject verb concept, subject verb agree number, you need feedback right when you do that. And, and which means you need a platform, you need a technology to provide feedback. Why? Because one thing that technology does is it's always available. Okay. Um, the other piece is if you have subscribed to the EGMAT course, make sure you attend the onboarding sessions. You get invites to them. Really important. That's where you meet those mentors. That's where you, you build those personal, personalized connections with those mentors. Okay. Um, also, watch these videos. They're all on our website to really say, hey, how do we provide concept level feedback, application level feedback? Also watch, if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll also see how do we provide feedback in, in stage three. Okay. Just in the context of SC, when you're learning concepts, 
you get 75 personalized feedback points and each one of these feedback uh, it is built around five learning items so it's not that you get a question wrong and we build a feedback on on top of it we look at at least five learning items and and um, and then then craft a feedback around it why is that important the reason why this is important is is because when you have five learning items you smooth out uh, the luck factor in this case similarly 23 application level feedbacks uh, uh, just in sc and and when you get to that cementing stage that's when you have 30 to 50 personalized feedback points and this is a mixture of of system and mentor these are all system level feedbacks that we do okay and it's because of these feedback when people react to these feedbacks they do their refinement um, based on these feedbacks that's when you achieve uh, that high score which is why you get that stats okay um now how many of you have seen when you take quizzes during the learning stage or even during the the the, the cementing stage we track two things one is how much time you spend revising your mistakes we track when you revise your mistakes how many of you have seen that in your quiz results screen okay if you think about it why would you need to track that we i mean it doesn't give us any benefit uh, if you think about that directly but the reason why we want to do that is because success is is an outcome of effort diligence and right methods and in that order and if you don't do this if you don't revise right away um, if you don't spend enough time revising then you're not putting in the effort or the diligence and that's i mean for us that data points really important for you that data points really important overall okay raghav has a question link to onboarding sessions raghav those sessions are every thursday um and and if you write to me at rajatari-chima.com if you haven't you sh it should be there right after your purchase but if you haven't received it write to me at rajatari-chima.com and and we'll make sure that that you get to it okay, but every thursday they are at the same time okay with that i want to thank everyone for joining me today that's um hopefully i will we were able to communicate what we wanted to do over here which is you know the fact that how do you go about building your study plan which is first thing is you start get your starting abilities then put that in psp and then build that study plan how should you read that study plan what does it mean with regards to the kind of effort that you need to put in that's something that that hopefully i was able to communicate then once you have that study plan um, how do you execute on it why is it important to go through the various stages of learning in that particular order uh, also how do you customize this based on your starting ability and then why is it important to focus on learning things first and then worry about timing towards the end and how to use feedback okay all right thank you very much guys um let me share the session pdf with you and once again uh great question strategic review i'll talk about this so is the session pdf uh, strategic review is what we call as the way to review a question uh, uh, and fill out the eg mat error log which is there at the end of uh, of, of of every uh, uh, course that we have so in sc course we have that in cr course we have that and so on and so forth and uh, pragyun uh, and and uh, and raghav thank you very much So Nihal has a question. He says, for someone planning for August intake, yeah, the new version does not make sense. We don't know anything about it. We do expect to get some hear something in the next eight to ten days, um, based on what my contacts at the GMAC have said. But but again, I I wouldn't want you to worry about it if you're going for round one. Absolutely not. what are the key takeaways that we should focus on for strategic review so for strategic review you know the way you do it uh, the the core components vary for uh, for 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 each um, question for each subsection so for sc there there's one for cr there's one and rc there's one but the principle really is that um, that 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 essentially you're trying to answer three fundamental questions 
which again go into a tree structure. So in SC, for example, um, the first question that you are, uh, answer is, did you spend enough time trying to extract the aspects of meaning? The answer to that is yes. Then the next question is, were you able to extract the aspects of meaning correctly? The answer to that is yes. Then the, the next piece that is there is, if you were able to do that in the original choice, then while selecting the choice that you uh, selected, did you keep those aspects in mind? And, and, and so the idea of this is you, you're kind of following an iterative approach to figure out why you faltered. And, and, and when you figure out why you faltered, then the corrective action is really obvious from this. And, 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 and you, you follow that corrective action, then the improvement happens in a very obvious manner. Okay. So Ashwini, hopefully that, that, that should help. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. I'm glad. All right. Um, the score validity remains the same in this case uh, for for either option. Not a, um, what do we do for AW and Nehal? Um, you know, write to me if you need help with AW. Let me just be very clear. We've had upwards of fifty thousand students. I've had three students who've asked me for AW out of those fifty thousand. Once you go through the EGMAT CR and EGMAT SC course, people don't ask for AWA. But if you still need help, write to me and we'll help you with AWA. Okay. This, that's the reason why we did not include it. It just doesn't didn't make sense to invest that time and money to to build an AWA module. Okay. Again, remember we have the number property session tomorrow and the CR session next week. Okay. All right. And and for those of you not connected with me on LinkedIn, do connect with me on on LinkedIn as well. And has a link to our YouTube channel and my LinkedIn. One is our YouTube channel. Number two is our LinkedIn overall. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. With that, I want to thank everyone. And uh, for those of you who are asking for, for the study plan piece, here is the link to our study plan as well. And do check out our free trial. We have a lot of stuff in the free trial if uh, you want to evaluate if EG Maths correct for you, right for you or not. Check out our free trial. About 2% of all our courses available in the free trial. Okay. All right. Thank you very much and have an excellent day.